Hello, d and RPGers, Game Masters and such. I'm going to talk about a skill check comparison between, um, let's say, an OSR game and 5e. And the reason why I'm doing this is I'm usually 95% of the time the Game Master. I'm playing the game. Mike, my friend, we had a big D&D a thon last weekend, wanted to Dungeon Master. And I was like, great. He picked Village of Homlet. And he wanted to do it 5e style. And we had eight people around the table. Maybe it was seven. Doesn't matter. And so we had the uh, obligatory 5e skill sheet, and you're filling this out. And um, I determined it was, you know, sitting back. It was interesting when you watch things if you game master. Now, I'm not knocking his dungeon master. I think he's, he does a great job. I just think that certain aspects of the game feel slow or sloggy, and people are looking things up, and they're, there's a better way. All right. And actually, I just wanted to compare the two. And it's actually kind of interesting, the results, because a lot of people think 5e, you get all these boosts because you get any skills. But uh, you can really incorporate this in your OSR game if you want to try to convert people from 5th edition or actually it's D&D 1 or whatever they're calling it now to uh, an OSR type game. And you can show statistically how it actually works out better for them as characters. All right. So let's show you how this goes. First question we must ask is. What is a skill check, right? Three guys are running through the dungeon. This is just an example, right? And they want to slide underneath a portcullis before they shut it. Do they make it? And so the dungeon master's job is to adjudicate whether something happened or not. Now, you might think that's really easy. Just, oh, they made it. Or, you know, sometimes you want to, suppose you have a really, really slow wizard or something. You got to make it interesting. These are things you just, I mean, I know it's one of these things. Sometimes it's easier just to have them roll and have dice decide, right? So that's why you have a skill check. You, you let the dice determine the outcome. It removes game master guilt. Oh my God, your character fell in this pit. And I don't have to feel bad. It's just dice roll, man. It has nothing to do with me. I'm removed from it. And people like to roll dice. They like it. It's like a Vegas feel. It's the risk. Oh, my God. It could go wrong. You know what I'm saying? So when I explain this to you, there's usually the original game, and I'm, I'm looking, comparing this to Swords and Wizardry, right? The um, white box version, that there was no skill check in there. It's something that kind of got made up house ruled in the, in the people's games, right? So let's talk about this. I My disclaimer, right off the bat, there are no skill checks in Swords of Wizardry white box. That's what I'm using as a comparison. I know there may be one in, in OSE, and I know Swords of Wizardry Complete really didn't have one. I mean, so I, I, it depends on the game, really, right? White Star has them, and, and actually uh, White Lies, those are two white box versions of games, right? They, they do have skill checks, right? So it depends on, you know, the game, right? Conventionally, DMs either had no skill checks at all. They just decided what happened. Roll low one or two on a 1d6 for a comparison. You can roll a saving throw. That's another one people like to use, right? Or roll under your stats to determine your skill situation. In fact, I did a little poll on Reddit, and that was the preferred one for a lot of people. Just roll a d20 under your stat, okay? So let's take a look at this 5th edition style. It's a little more confusing. Dice roll, you add your ability modifier and your proficiency, if applicable, to beat a difficulty check of DC of 20, right? Now, I picked 20 because I, I do not see the sense of anybody trying to pass easy or very easy or even medium. It makes no sense to me. If, if you're going to do a skill check, at, the reason why you would do it is because they could fail and it's hard. That's just my thought. Uh, you think differently, put it in the comments. I just don't see the sense. And, oh, we're going to do a very easy check. Everyone roll and see if you can beat a five, you know, even with all your bonuses. Uh, okay, anyways, so I have a couple things. I, I know if you've seen anything in my video library here on YouTube, I have a previous video. I'm going to go back and forth on this where I explain all about 1D6 checks. And I go through all this. I'm not going to go through it again. You can go back and see the video. What I do use in my games is this modified version of things, right? Where I do, your skill checks are based on your stat scores. If you have a three or four, you're abysmal, okay? And basically, you get a no chance whatsoever on uh, passing something that's hard. You're just really bad at it. Just the way it goes, right? And obviously, this is in the more of the normal range from five to 12. And then as you start getting your stats at a higher level, you're chances of passing a hard check is like three out of six, which is 50%. Now these are all five. Anything italicized in here is the five E 
skill checks. I just stuck them in this. So people that are learning, they play 5e, come to play with me, turn around and say, well, I want to do animal handling. Well, that's underneath wisdom. Do a wisdom check. What's your wisdom score? Oh, it's a 13. It's a two out of six. That's all it is, right? And so it makes it really easy for people to join your game because you still have skills if you wanted to use them. And a lot of times I don't really like to use them, but if you had to use them, you have them. So people say, oh, okay, I get this game, right? I also have something where they increase in your skill stat at intervals, 3rd, 6th, ninth, and 12th. And I just put this in a few months ago, and I find it to be an incentive for players to feel like they're developing their character over time. Some people would wave this and say it's silly, but uh, I think it's interesting. Suppose someone really, really is bad, let's say, or de- let's say their dexterity is, let's say, a, a 12, right? One out of six, right? And at third level, you say, I want to improve my dexterity skill level. You can become a two out of six. You're not changing the stat. You're just changing your ability at doing something. So you trained. You get better at something. You're juggling now. I don't know. Whatever. Anyways, and then you can keep increasing it or increase another stat. So it's it's a choice. And I'm going to give an example of this in this video, right? You can increase your character stat. It only increases your odds at doing certain tasks in that group, right? Try not, and this is what I don't, no stat above a five out of six. It's kind of pointless. If it's six out of six, then it's just, you're always going to be perfect at it. So why even have the thing? But it's kind of where I go with this, right? But the other thing you have is I also do my thief skills this way too. Makes it easy. Everything, skill checks are always D6. So where it's thief skills, whatever. And I have a video explaining all that. But it makes it really, really easy at the table, you want to go fast. I, percentile dice are a little slower for people. I, I, I know I don't want to ruin my immersion, I guess you might say, right? And even in White Star, this is my White Star page, it, it it functions the same way. Your skill checks are all set up the same. And that and the reason why I'm just showing you this is that I try to keep it consistent through games. So if I change genres, I, I can the, the, everybody knows what to do, right? And this is what happens to your role the harder the the thing, and these are qualifiers. I have a video all about that, so I don't have to go into that. But likewise, it's just a very, very interesting way of of doing this, okay? Now, um, I saw this blog post, I think I talked about in the other video, and I thought it was really interesting. Um, And this is kind of, he puts this here, and this is something about um, philosophy of stat and skill checks, okay? Only may the result in question and where success or failure matters. So make sure it's like if it's, for example, we were playing the other day, last weekend, and uh, the thief wants to investigate the room. Okay, roll a check, DC 15 check. Okay, you you passed. I think he had a plus 10 on his roll, so it was like, okay, whatever. So some half percent chance you're going to pass. My question is, he's going to find clues that's going to push the story forward. Just let him have it. He looks at the desk. I want to look at the desk. If someone mentions they're going to look at the desk, whatever's in that desk, give it to them. As a dungeon master, just give it to them. It's not going to break your game. It'll make your game go faster. If you feel like every time they touch something, oh, there's a pair of shoes on the floor. I'm going to use investigation. And they have to roll for it. You say, okay, lift up the shoe. Oh, there's a false heel. You come out and there's a key. Yeah, My advice is if they say, I'm investigating the shoe, I'm going to look at it. Just turn around and give them the clue. Just give them whatever's in it. It'll make your game go faster, and it stops unnecessary rolling, which is horribly boring for players. If you're watching one person do a bunch of rolls on several objects in that room, it doesn't make any sense. And um, sometimes it's good just say, like this guy says, the DM Shalari. I don't know what this is, but your character can't do that. It's not possible. If you have a three or four and you're trying to read some ancient scribe that you know, your intelligence is that low, it's like, I'm just let it go. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes, like, all this stuff is, there is no separate perception stat because stat rules are the normal way information becomes available to players, right? It's not the way. That, I mean, you have to listen. You're listening to the room. I I, I'm, I do a perception check. Okay, then you see orcs in the tree. If I mention a tree line, you go, I'm going to go check the tree line. Which side do you check it? Left, right, left, right? Okay, you see them. If they're listening and you're playing a game and they mention it, you give it to them. That teaches them to listen to what you're saying. Just saying, just roll, it just becomes a game of rolling and no one really is listening to what you're doing. When do I get to roll? What do I have to roll, right? This is a great thing. The link will be um, on that page, but it talks about different ways of doing it. He has his own style and really delves into it. Good on this person. Um, 
So let's talk about this comparison I'm going to do, right? It's a long video. I'm sorry about that. But this is such an interesting concept. So I did this 46 drop the lowest is on this roll log, right? And it gave me a set of scores. And I set them up for source of wizardry white box, right? If you're above a 15, you get a plus one. Where this guy, he starts getting pluses. And the total for this guy is plus two and plus eight. Now, you already see a difference between the... 5e and let's say an osr game there's an abundance of pluses and we everybody already knows that i don't have to go into details on that but you also get hmm, plus one if you're a human so all these scores will go up even more now you're up to a plus 12 compared to a plus two right right now then you're going to turn on and you're going to get a proficiency bonus to your strength because i'm comparing fighters they get plus two proficiency and strength and this is just for skill check we're just doing skill checks here right I'm not doing hitting or anything all right so now i have it in parentheses 16 uh, total of bonuses because you have these proficiencies in these two different categories, right? Compared to the two. So it hasn't moved, right? So it's sort of a funny thing to look at, right? Now let's do this. Once again, here's my disclaimer. I want to make sure that I am not speaking for everybody in OSR, but I'm saying if you're doing a 1D6 system and if you had the situation set up like I did or 17, 18, I'll explain why I said 17, 18 is a, a three out of six. Why do you get a bigger bonus compared to these other groups, right? This is going to really kind of change your perspective about doing a skill check. Now, look at this. If you have a 17 or 18, the statistical probability of rolling that 3D6 um, and coming up with either one of those numbers is very small. It's like a half a percent for just to get an 18. It's almost impossible, right? And if you compare that to a 17, it's 1.38%. You put them together, that's like 2% chance of you're going to roll a 17 or 18. So if that's the sense... I'd give them a little bit more of a bump. So they get, you are that good. You have a strength 18, you're like 50% likely to lift anything hard. That's 50-50. If it's worth the roll, you know what I'm saying? 13 to 16 is at 33%. If you need to do the check, sometimes I just don't do it. Why? You know what I'm saying? I want to lift up this gate. You should be able to do it. And there's actually something already put in most of the things for lifting bars and stuff. But let's say you want to lift a box over your head and throw it. Well, okay. You should be able to do that. You're pretty strong, you know? But the idea is to keep games moving, you want to have a simple way of doing this, as I think it, right? Once again, this is counterintuitive. A good roll is a low number. A bad roll is a high number because you're. it's easier to say you have a three out of six, so three or less. You have a two out of six, two or less. Sometimes four out of six, and you want to give him a bonus because he's a giant. And I'll show you that example. Um, it's easier to say four or less, right? It, it, you're saying it across the table, right? So if I just took it, based on my methodology, all right? To pass a hard check, right, a DC 20, the fire must roll this number higher. So think about this. He has to roll a tw to get to a 20. He has to roll 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So there's six scores out of 20, which means a 30% chance of him actually passing that check. Think about it for a second. Digest that, all right? So once again, to pass his check, he has a plus five. Okay, so he has to roll a 15 or higher. So you have to roll 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20. Now each increment's worth five. So that's six times five. That's 30%. 30% chance of passing. And you can see how these go. Dexterity has a plus two. So he has to roll 18, 19, or 20, which means five, 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 15%. And I don't have to keep going on. I think you understand what we're doing here, right? So this is your chance of passing that check as a first level fighter, okay? Now, looking at the way these stats are set up, uh, first level fighter in OSR, if you follow this way of doing it, the passive strength check is 33%. How's that? It's two out of six. It's 33%. Dexterity would be 33%. Constitution's 33%. And if it's a one, it's like 17, 17, and 33. Now, how do they compare to each other? Well, obviously, in an OSR game, if you're using a 1d6, it actually works out better for the players. They might not like it because you're using a six-sided dice. They think it's smaller in their head. There's less of a chance, right, compared to a d20. And maybe people don't like it because it's not granular enough, which means there's not enough, you know, cutting it up or small enough or whatever they're doing to show that much of an increase. You don't have to show a lot of increase. I mean, I, I think consistency in the game and using the mind is probably a whole lot better theory of the mind than is. But if you compare the two, in every category – Obviously, the OSR D6 method seems to work better for the player. Okay, but they might, they're not going to see it that way, but that's what's going on. Okay, now 
let's talk about increases over time. Now in fifth edition, you get a plus two in your proficiency at first level, a plus three at fifth level, and plus four, and that would be a ninth level. Okay. Looking at how this thing works out. So at fifth level, proficiency is now plus three. So now it's going to be a 14 or higher. So it gives a 35% chance of passing. The other ones stay static. They're not going to change, right? But this is going to go up an increment of 5%, your, your ability to pass it, and five more percent when it gets to ninth level, if you're just looking at sheer proficiency, okay? So increase in proficiency, increase of skill level. Using the methodology I'm showing you, right, um, you would actually still get increases at third, sixth, ninth, and twelfth, right? I don't, never had characters go above 12. I think one time we played a high-level Cyclopean Deeps game, which is really interesting, but after 10th level, it gets really hard to DM, but in this case, um, these things are not going to change the stats. I keep them the same and only, and the skills are only going to go up. And this is just my methodology I came up with and probably other people would probably use. I don't know. Anyways, but look at the increase here. First level is 33. Now I can increase any one stat. I said increase my strength because I'm the fighter. I'm going to do strength and constitution for this. So, so it becomes a three or six. That's 50%. At sixth level, I get to increase now the constitution. Now it's at 50. Then at ninth, I get to increase the strength again. And now it's at 66. Now keep in mind, you can't go above five out of six, but you see what's happening. The climb, comparatively speaking, the the OSR to the fifth edition at ninth level, the OSR has a, generally speaking, a bigger advantage when doing a skill check. I mean, you can show this to your players. You're going, like, wow, I didn't think about it like that. Well, most people aren't going to try to break numbers, I guess, to try to figure what's going on. But for me, I find it fascinating. I'm like, but for them, they think they're not getting something. They're getting more, actually, which is sort of funny. Anyways, and now I have to really kind of go into this, okay? Because I'm kind of not really telling the whole picture because it's way more complicated if you've done 5e. You can only add your proficiency bonus to two of the skills, right? So here's a fighter. They get skills in acrobatics, animal handling, athletics, uh, history, insights, perception, and survival. They can only pick two of these they can add their proficiency to. And I, I think that's that. Once they do that, I, you know, it's kind of what it is. And there's probably those other things when you get the feats and all that crap. But the idea behind it, once again, it's like the game gets more convoluted. It's not simplified. Now, like I said, my little stat list that I have here, and this is the 5 E. these are all these stuck in here, makes it kind of simpler for the game master to kind of keep the game going and not have to worry about players fiddling with it so something to keep in mind okay so you're kind of like this gets a little what do you have on what and do you get the proficiency or do you not get your proficiency these are things that slow a game down on the table right so here's my upshot because you're probably we're going with this if you're bringing players from 5e and wish to use skill checks now you don't have to but if you want to using a 1d6 is a very simple method to find quick results right uh, there's less waiting on players to calculate their scores. And that's important. I, I, I think that's what made it slow for me as a as a player, watching people trying to figure out what they do, right? Or or asking many times, okay, what do I roll? What do I roll? This is this makes it a little, you know, quicker, right? Simpler method with an added increase keeps the players interest. They like to see their 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 characters grow. So they they want to see this over time then become better at something, you know? And so besides their increased ability to hit things, these are the other aspects. So it's something that could take into consideration. And this is really, really uh, interesting from a dungeon master point of view. I, I can put all their skills on one page and I'll show you what this looks like. We're doing Northland Saga and this is what it looks like for everybody. And I know my picture is in the way, but you get the idea. I put their hit points, they're at first level. No, second level. This is their hit points. And this is their skills for each one of these things. So I have this thing printed out sitting on the table. And as they're going, I say, okay, you roll two out of six. Or Eventually, they know what to roll. But at the beginning, they don't. And as they increase their skills, I would change this, obviously, and, and make it easier on them. Wow, really quick way of playing the game, just letting you know. And sometimes quick means immersion, which means faster they go. We went through, in a matter of two hours, a whole lot of different places, and they were totally into the game because we were not bogged down with looking numbers up, right? Okay. And this is my only recommendation, right? 
Only use the skill check if it's hard. Easy and very easy and medium, I just don't see the sense in it. You only do it when it's actually like really a crucial situation, right? And overrolling. Oh, my God. It's, that happens so much. I've seen so many games where people, oh, can I, what do I roll? What do I roll? And, and especially with investigation. I investigate this. Then I investigate this. Then I investigate this. And I think even Dungeon Craft, Professor Dungeon Master says, you know, one number for the entire room. And it's just done, you know, stay everybody and just tell them everything's in there. I, I, I believe if you give a description and they ask about it, they get it. And that makes it a lot more fun. Makes them listen to what you're doing and in, in the actual explanation of things, painting the colors in the mind. All right. With that, hopefully this was interesting. I know it's a long video. You got something out of it, something to take back. Please leave comments if you say, oh, my God, this is kind of like stupid. You know, you, I don't know what you want to say. But also, um, you know, subscribe if you find this interesting. And I haven't put out a video in a while because I haven't really had anything new to talk about. This was something new, so I decided to put this in here. With that, I hope you have a great day and um, totally game on.